and uh, welcome to another episode of the Comics Brew and Chew podcast, the one where we actually get it in the month we intended to record it. Uh, Let's go. Yeah, we're we're getting we're turning into a real podcast a year later. And technically, we are a year late <clears throat> on the month we intended to record this. We are, but that is just because this book is what it is, and that book for today is a uh, Prince of Cats put out. Well, it's put out a while back. It's put out by Ronald Wimberly through uh, Image Comics. I got this. Oof, my junior year in college, so that was like three years ago, and uh, and then I gave a copy to somebody, and then this copy that I am currently holding, I had still wrapped in the plastic when I decided we use it for the podcast, because I liked it that much, I decided never to open it again. <clears throat> um, Prince of Cats is an interesting book. Uh, it is the a modern retelling of Romeo and Juliet, as if it was in the eighties in New York. With samurai swords. With samurai swords. And it's told from the perspective of Tybalt instead of Romeo and Juliet, which is also pretty cool. Uh, instead of me blabbering on about it, because I don't actually know how long this episode's going to be, having heard the uh, the kind of air in the room before we started recording, I'll kind of pass this off to whoever wants to start talking about it, and we Why can go from there. Why don't you give us a plot rundown first? Yeah, I then. barely understood it. To be <laughs> what do you mean? I, I was the last one to read it. I flipped through it. And it's it's literally just Romeo and Juliet, just but the side see, stuff. It's not though, like I mean, it is, but most of it is a prequel. No, this to, is this is running concurrently to Romeo and Juliet. This is all the, the side stuff from the book. I butt my thumb at the comes in at the end of this. Yeah, because that's, that's the, the that's, start. Of yeah, it. when I got to that point, I was like, "Isn't this the start of Romeo and Juliet?" No, I barely paid attention. No, in that high that's like midway guess. through. That's, is it that late? And it's I haven't read. read yeah, really no, since my because year in high uh, the I bite my thumb at the is when um, they kill each other, and then it's a little bit more progress, like a little more progression, and then it's the death of Romeo. Okay. But this kind of runs concurrently with a lot. Like it does start before Romeo and Juliet yeah. technically starts, but it also runs concurrently through, like a, a good chunk of, of it through the actual plot of the main story. But at the same point in time, it's also so separately removed that it almost doesn't matter that it's a tie into Romeo and Juliet because of what it is. It's pretty much just watching like these swordsmen gallivant around trying to be better than one another while also pining for the affection of the local women. Yeah. So I'm going to say this about it. I absolutely loved the art. I loved the style of it. Anything with a Shakespearean influence usually interests me a lot. It's one of the reasons why it was a lot easier on the first Thor than a lot of people were. Um, I had a bit of a hard time following some of the narrative of this. Yeah. But I... It, it feels like a book that lends itself to rereads. Um, and I really appreciated a lot of... I don't know how intentional it was, but I felt a lot of a sort of modern Kurosawa influence on it, which makes sense because a lot of Kurosawa's work, things like Ron, were very Shakespeare-inspired. Um, I just... It, it, like, all of the pieces, the art, the inspiration, the type of story that it was telling was all very much up my alley, but something about the way that it came together, I had a bit of an issue with following it i i like again going on the whole like the inspiration and the style it's done and is really like the art is incredible i really like the art the whole choice of using old english really threw the whole book off for me i found it incredibly hard to understand what was going on also like going back to the art like it's nice but it's also hard to remember who characters are i found myself flipping into that little um, yeah that guy to the guy front at the where start each character a lot to figure out who was and who. it's like you're trying to figure what out who it, is who and, and, and like who they're and like they don't <laughs> they don't usually call people out by name you're yeah. just supposed to know who you're following and just <clears throat> i don't know i just it's something that i think would have helped you if i had more recently read romeo and julia and had a more of a I mean, everyone knows, like, the beats of Romeo and Juliet, yeah. but because this was so delving into the, you know, side characters, it's not stuff that people are as fluent with, which I like because it gave them more leeway with the story, but it's also, you know, because you're 
not as well versed in it. You're not as yeah. well versed in where things are going here. It's just, it's almost like it, it's a bunch of really good ideas that got put together really bad, in my opinion. I'm just trying not to munch into the mic. No, yeah, I get you. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I just I got to the ending and I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. The, it you know, did two feel bo- dies right? Like I, I, it's been like I said, I didn't really pay attention to like the, the kind of, of spin on Shakespeare's work that you know, like Kurosawa would do when he applied Shakespeare narrative structure to you know a samurai film, and I felt very much like that where it was kind of you know anchored in reality but it has this little heightened step above and you like it didn't seem weird to me that they were using the shakespearean language at some points i wanted them to go just full iambic pentameter Mm. um but it just i like i I don't want to sound like i'm ripping into the book because i really did like it but I really felt like once I finished it, I needed to flip back to the beginning and start it again. That's how I felt, but I really didn't feel like reading it again. I really didn't. Like, I was like, I feel I finished it, and I was like, I didn't understand that at all. I was like, maybe I should give it another go. I just couldn't be bothered. I have no idea what I read. Not yeah, gonna lie. It's, uh, that's exactly what I feel. I have no idea. Like, I was like, this is like Romeo and Juliet, but there's like profanity. Mass amounts of profanity. A modern twist. Everyone's fighting with samurai swords, and there's, like, a list of people who are really good, but they never really dive into that whole list. Like, at the beginning, it was like, this is going to be cool. It's like, there's, like, sword fights, and, you know, everyone's, like, ranked, and, like, you know, it's a friendly competition. But then halfway through, they're just killing each other. And it's just like, well, why, what's the fucking point of all this? I still have no idea what I read. I need spark notes. And it doesn't help that it's been... 14 years since I read Romeo and Juliet. Oh my god. Yeah. It's been a while for me too and just like I didn't just I just <clears> didn't <throat> pay attention. Yeah. Because my English teacher in freshman year was kind of an ass. It was always because I really like Shakespeare. Like I made I you know I have a complete collection of his works and I enjoy it. Um, But Romeo and Juliet was never one that I cared for. Um, I was really big into Hamlet when I read that in high school, really big into Othello when I read that in college, but Romeo and Juliet never grabbed me the way some of his other stuff did. I like a lot of his, you know, sonnets and his poetry and, you know, all of that stuff, but Romeo and Juliet just wasn't my thing. I just like the, um, kind of echoing what everybody else has said, like, taking the, like, the verbiage from... Shakespeare's work and putting it in the modern day and then just the sudden juxtaposition against like modern slang or I mean even now it's dated slang because it's supposed to be set back in like the 80s to early 90s but like to have that difference of like them speaking in like the lines that you would hear from the Shakespearean works and then all of a sudden have it cut in with like drugs rap like modern language like them obsessing over like shoes and stuff yeah it's like you have contemporary-ish, you know, 1980s setting, but then you're a step removed from that, you know, a step removed from reality with the Shakespeare, you know, language. But then you're another step removed with all of the samurai stuff going on, and it's, like, three... Like, you have something, and you remove one step from reality, and I think people get into it a lot more, but then you have that second layer that's not from the source material into this whole other step from reality that the book is doing. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion kind of comes from. I think that's what it is. It's the fact that it's split into three separate camps. You either like the work as a whole, you like the work because it is that modern-day samurai street-fighting gang concept, Mm -hmm. or you like the fact that it's a modern telling of a classic story, and you like Shakespeare, but you also like the idea of bringing it to the present. I see the book. Yeah. Like, uh... <clears throat> kind of like the DiCaprio movie where, like, oh, draw your sword, and they're all pulling out, like, guns and stuff and having shootouts instead of sword fights. Like, some people got a kick out of that movie because it is the classic story they remember mm. with that modern twist. The other thing that we haven't mentioned, which may or may not pertain to how we all view the book, which I'm not trying to, like, skew us in any particular way, but the book takes place in, like, the city or the inner city, and it's made up of mostly African-American characters. Yeah. Like, it's not... 
the white or whatever the characters were in the original story because I think some of them were like. That was so bad for the mic. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> By the way. We do have beverages and snacks, which we forgot to call out. We got Oreos and we got Keebler Fudge Stripe cookies, and it's too early in the day for us to start drinking. Yeah. So we just have a smattering of whatever we felt like picking up from the local convenience store. But, um, <clears throat> like, it's told from a world that we're all not really a part of, which may or may not play into it, and I know mm. the author and artist himself is also African-American. And that really, and, like, a lot of this, like, he grew up in the 80s. Like, a lot of this is just, like, stuff he really liked put into this book. That's actually why I just asked for the book. One thing that I think really does give a lot more context, I don't know how many people read the back of the book, but I love that he describes it, it's described over here as like the B-side of a mixtape, this graphic yeah. novel, and that was my absolute favorite thing about it, because I had a hard time sometimes jumping from character to character, scene to scene, you know, the actual flow of the book on a narrative level was what I struggled with, but as a sort of, almost like a tone poem, like, just the ideas and the style and the flow of, you know, from beat to beat, not on a narrative level, but on just kind of this surreal, you know, almost musical or art type piece. I really loved all of the ideas. It was trying to reconcile all of the ideas together in my head that I struggled with, but maybe that wasn't the point. Maybe it was just, you know, like it says on the back of the book, this B-side of a mixtape that's giving you all of these ideas, um, putting them out there. They don't all have to mesh. You don't have to like them. You take what you want. You leave what you want. And it's it, it really is something that I think everyone is going to, take something different out of you're gonna like some of it you're not gonna like some of it but you know the pieces are all there it's like you said Fred what the author was into and he doesn't really give a shit if you're into the exact yeah. same things that he is <clears throat> the nice thing though is um I noticed that uh <clears throat> well I mean this it kind of hit me in a certain way because of where I kind of stand not like ideologically or anything but like I watch a lot of anime because that's the type of person I am and it strikes me in a couple of chords for, like, shows I've seen that are similar. Like, it's not very much like the Boondocks, but it does have that kind of sketch to it a little bit. But um, if you think of, like, Afro Samurai or, like, even um, Samurai Champloo, which is set in, like, ancient Japan, but a lot of it is hip-hop inspired, like, the soundtrack to it, the intro, and then, like, the way they fight and the slang they use. Like, it's set in ancient Japan, but it's, like, taking ancient Japan and taking some modern-day stuff and sliding it back into that point in time. For me, this is just the reverse. It's taking their fighting styles, their way, like, cultures, everything. And, like, this really focuses on, like, the way of the swordsman and, like, the honor that comes from, like, proper duels and, like, winning duels and settling things with your steel. And, like, the better swordsman has the claim to stuff. And bringing that to now. And even, like, infusing that into some of, like, the costume choices. Like, I noticed on my, like, flipping through it before we started, there's a guy wearing a Yankees hat. And then the Yankees hat turns into, like, a samurai helmet around him. Mm -hmm. And, like... Just some of the costume choices, like, yeah, a lot of them are just dressed as, like, street punks, which is also a cool aesthetic to have. But then they kind of work that into, like, the guise of, like, a samurai, either wearing, like, the usual, like, samurai robes that they wore or the actual full-on armor that you see them depicted as wearing. Romeo's outfit has, like, that, like, classic when you picture, like, Prince Charming, where it's, like, big puffy shoulders and then, like, baggy sleeves with, like, vertical stripes. Yep. He has that on his jacket. But it's very, like, modernized, and I thought that was a really cool design choice. Like, yeah, there's a lot about this book that's nice, but then everything just doesn't... The design <coughs> is fantastic. Like, mm. every panel I yeah. was in love with. Every panel. The coloring's really yeah. nice. The coloring. The there's that scene I was showing you earlier, John, where it's a fight in, a, um, in like, a dance club. Mm. And because it's a, it's a club, all the lights are changing colors, but it means every panel on that page is the same color. And the action's lost in the background of it. Not lost in the background, but, like, the coloring is just every panel. So there's no deciphering where what ends because it's all just red. Mm -hmm. And then it juxtapositions to blue and then, like, other colors when the scene changes. Actually, you just hit the page now. Yep. The next page is immediately blue and purple. It's just, it's such a drop-off. And then everything in those panels is just shades of the primary color they're using. That stuff actually reminded me a bit, um... I don't know why, but a bit of the opening scene in Blade, the nightclub. Oh, yeah, the nightclub dance scene? Yeah. Um, 
No, I got the song in my head. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, like, it's definitely cool. And like the way they go about it, like I was saying, if they animated this, it would oh, yeah. turn out to be a fantastic. Mm. They would have to retain the art style, though. They oh, would yeah. absolutely. You can't. Which is it, totally possible. Like yeah. that, I, that art style seems so familiar. Yep. Like I've seen it somewhere before. And like just to watch the fluidity of like these sword fights, because he actually puts the effort into making yep. them be sword fights, not just a quick one oh, yeah. and done. Like yeah, a, no, a couple of them are one and done. Well, but the stuff when it lingers on yeah. a fight, you feel the fight. And like I said, where sometimes I had trouble following the narrative, I never had trouble following the action. Everything is yeah. so well framed and so well portrayed. And that's again to where I feel like a lot of that. Kurosawa yeah. comes from. And, like, it's cool because you get to watch, like, that trope of, like, if you're a badass swordsman, you walk in there and you get surrounded by, like, three or four guys, you're still going to be the only one walking out. And that happens at least two or three times yeah. in this book. And no matter when it happens, it's still cool because, like, yeah. everybody's got a weird variety of weapons because, like, you got regular swords, you got, like, more, like, European-style stuff. You definitely got, like, the katanas and the Japanese-inspired stuff. But then you just got, like, some weird, like, hook blades. Yeah. You got guys fighting with knives. There's some dudes running around with, like, these big Harley Quinn-esque mallets. Yeah. Like, it's just... This is a dude with a box cutter. Oh, yeah. Well, no, Romeo has that at one point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and the other cool thing that happens in it is, like, beforehand, it was kind of like the Montagues and the Capulets in the main book. <laughs> you just sneezed on me, cat. <laughs> yeah, by the way, we actually brought a cat in for the Prince of Cat episodes. Just to, if she has anything to say, it'll be of note. But um, actually, so that's when, what that was. Yeah, when I was when I was reading beforehand, she was actually hunched over the small table next to me, looking at the book as I was flipping the pages. So I don't know what was up. She she just likes to sit on books. Right. It's one of her favorite <laughs> things to sit on. Like if I just if you leave a book out, she will sit on it. Nice. It's weird. I mean, granted, if you leave a sit book out, I'll probably sit on it. Yeah. But uh. Um, but, like, in the main story, it was all about, like, who was in control of the city. The Montagues or the Capulets. Which is why I understand when they made that movie in the 90s, they made it very, uh, like, mafioso-esque yeah. gang warfare. But in this one, it's cool because they took it in a different angle. They're not just, like, street fighting, really. Like, they have those swordsman duels, but it's like, oh, who's the best? The real, like, gang, like disruption between one another is just them tagging the city mm -hmm. it's like we own this turf because we tagged it as such yeah. and then we'll duel over it and the winner gets to put up their tag yeah which is neat because romeo just starts out like you know he's like this great swordsman and stuff but he seems so unassuming because like he has like a regular job and he just he, you see him go out at night and tagging stuff and while everybody else is just fighting like to be that number one swordsman and he just sits at the top because he is mm -hmm. and then later on when it gets called into question you get to see those fights when they really matter, yep. which is cool. But. I have to say, my favorite part about it was the note in the back of where it came from and how it came to be. What was that? I didn't really read that. Um, often teased for his private school vocabulary, talking too white. Oh, that makes sense. Which is kind of cool to then take that and have, like, these hoodlum characters speaking in such a verbose language. Must be, like, what his life story was like. Like, I've yeah. read that note before, but it's been a while. Like I said, I read it, and then I gave it away. But the nice thing is, they pretty much only... S I, I remember seeing this on Image.com uh, when they were uh, hyping up that they were re-releasing it. Because mm -hmm. it came out a while ago. They re-released it in this format. I didn't realize it was this big mm -hmm. or this nice. Um, it's an oversized format. It's hardcover. It's got the dust jacket and everything. The inside super nice because it's bright pink. Like it's very vibrant poppy yeah. colors. It definitely catches your eye. Oh yeah. Oh, I didn't take the dust jacket off. That's I, cool. I, I've literally never taken the dust jacket off. Mm. I like that's nice. What is the back? Well, the front's the embossed Prince of Cats with the two um, houses. A heart and a spade. The back's pretty much the same. Thing. But with the Montague and Capulet like shield thing oh, on wow. the back. Yeah. It's weird because you need to catch the light because it's black on black. Yeah. Kind of like, gloss black. I'm Matt Black. Yeah. Yeah, the colors I absolutely loved. It has a very like pop art feel yeah, to it. Yeah, which is nice. And then it's also just got like that vibrant like neon like the color scheme to it, where like oh hey, we're fighting at night in like dance clubs and out in the streets of the city. So like all you'll get is the glow from like the neon lights and stuff. And the fact that that carries over to like just their individual 
And like looks too. That too is why I 100% agree. This would look gorgeous animated. Oh, yeah. And you could like, I, you could almost hear, you know, what the music would be, what the compositions would be for this. Oh, yeah. It's also hysterical that they like literally walk around in like broad daylight with samurai swords. With samurai swords. And just yeah, and that's why it has like it's like. I, I keep wanting to say modern day, but it's 1980s, but it's a step removed from reality with the yeah. Shakespeare stuff, but then it's a totally separate step removed from reality with the samurai stuff. It's like if you took, like, The Wire, The Warriors, and then, like, Seven Samurai and put yeah. them all together. and then That's just, actually kind of, yeah. And then, like, animated it and threw in a dash of Shakespeare. Yep. But that dash of Shakespeare... That dash is literally every line of dialogue. <laughs> I was going to say, but that dash is like throwing a dash of garlic into something that didn't really need the garlic. Yep. You'll taste it, and it's what turns you off. Which or I, gets you excited about it if you're yeah, Italian, um, <laughs> or like Shakespeare. Yeah, well, I was going with my <laughs> example of garlic, but um, yeah, just like the different following the different characters too. Like there is a depth of characters in this book that if you actually follow them, the story makes sense. Like I, because I remember them having multiple storylines. Like there's the Tybalt story, and then there's the Romeo story, Juliet part. And then, like, just the love triangles that start emerging between the different characters. So many love triangles. Yeah. And it's cool because, like, instead of it being like, oh, we're a royal family that's cousins and, like, this yeah. is so-and-so. It's just like, hey, we, our family never moved out of the city. Yeah. So, like, my cousin lives the next street over. Yeah. It's not a thing I have in my family, but I know it's a thing that a lot of people mm -hmm. have. Because I went to school with kids that, like, this, their cousin took the same bus as us because they lived right down the yeah. street. This has almost made me want to reread it. Romeo and Juliet? No. Hearts of Cats. Oh, bro. I was going to say. No. I don't know. Not like, Romeo and Juliet. I just, see, like. I have it if you want it. No. I, I kept, when I was reading it, I was like, where's, uh, I can't remember their names now. I kept thinking their names the entire time I was reading it. Rosencrantz. And Gildenstein, Gildenstein from from Rosencrantz and Gildenstern, yeah. Timon and Pumbaa. Like I kept thinking of um, people from like Hamlet and other yeah. stories, and I was like, wait, no, that's the wrong one. It's just I don't know. It's not Ham Hamlet is so good. I think Hamlet would actually lend itself well to a kind of pop art take like this. You mean Lion King? You mean Kimba the White Lion? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I remember seeing, uh, unrelated, I remember seeing a trailer for Kimba the White Lion yeah. on, like, a Godzilla VHS from when I was a kid, and being like, <laughs> it's Lion they're King. ripping off Lion King. It's actually... Little did I know this VHS tape is from, like, the yeah. 1970s or whenever Kimba <laughs> came out. The fun part is, though, so the guy that made Kimba mm -hmm. is, like, they call him the godfather of anime, because he was one of the first guys to pioneer the cheaper method to making it. So in the 1950s and 60s, television programs actually started running, like, actual anime while Americans were running, like, the 50s and 60s cartoons that people grew up with. The guy that... I can't remember his name, and it's pissing me off. Um, he's the guy that made Astro Boy. Ma oh, okay. He made Kimba the White Lion. I didn't realize that. And it's funny because um, Astro Boy's real name in Japan is The Atom, but they couldn't do it over here because DC Comics yeah. would have sued them with the character The Atom. But uh, <clears throat> he made Kimba the White Lion because he, growing up, it was during um, the U.S. military's reconstruction of Japan. So a lot of what was over there was Western influences. Mm. And they played a lot of Disney movies. So he would go and watch Disney movies four, five, six times a week and sit in the back of the theater. And he knew all these movies by heart. So he would sit there and he'd draw out parts of the movie while he was watching it and practice doing art. And he realized while watching Disney movies the way that Disney made cartoons for so cheap. And that was with minimal movement of the eyes and the mouth, and mm. the um, to have the character perform the same walking motion, yep. and just have the background change behind them so you can keep reusing the yeah. same animation. Yeah. And that's how he made anime for so cheap, and that's how that uh, started. So then he makes Kimba. Years later, whether or not they stole it or whether or not it's just a case of similar ideas, Disney makes The Lion King. Which Kimba is, came out first, though. No, it did. No, I'm not saying it didn't come out first. Kimba yeah. came out years later. The Lion King came out. Whether or not they knew about Kimba or not, putting that aside, when people started calling out Disney for The Lion King, saying it was a ripoff of Kimba, the creator of Kimba had already died. Yeah. But his estate said if Disney used any part of his movie, 
to make the Lion King, that would be the greatest honor in his life because Disney was his biggest inspiration yeah. to get into the medium to begin with. Mm, so he wouldn't be upset. He'd no, be he flattered. oh he would he would take it as a compliment. He'd be like, "Hey, you used my movie to base your move my, base your <laughs> movie off of, and then you made it better." I'm not saying Kimba's bad or anything, but his look on it would probably be, "Hey, Disney did it." It's golden. Yeah. He is like every teenage girl in America. Like, Disney can do no wrong. <laughs> Any, I guess, wrapping up thoughts on <laughs> what? Prince I was, of Cats? Normally I'd be like, hey guys, what did you think of this book? But I know it's going to be on like the bottom of everybody's list for the books we've read. But I'm just trying to think of like, what other classic works would you want to see like, remo- like classic stories put in this style? Sort of, yeah. Kind of like a modernization slash like pop take on it. I would have liked this a lot better if it was Macbeth. I like Macbeth. Yeah, I just, I don't know Shakespeare. I no, I just, it, it doesn't even... Read it. It, I, was gonna say, I had to read it, yeah. and I hated it. I was going to say, it doesn't even need to be Shakespeare, because the book I'm thinking of wouldn't be Shakespeare to do this what with. What are you thinking of? Progress it a little more to the 90s, and then make it um, Beowulf. Okay. I can see that. The big monster, like Grendel and Grendel's mother. Yeah. Would be the drug epidemic of the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Yeah, actually. I could totally see that. And then make it more set like The Wire, where like it's the high rise projects in the inner cities. Mm-hmm. And then like Grendel's cave is like one of the apartments inside. Like kind of that ju- that, that dread take where like yep. the whole high rise was. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I don't know. This whole book for me. No. I don't. If you like Shakespeare. And you're like an English teacher, they'd probably like this. <laughs> you're an English teacher. I, I, yeah, like I really, like I really like Shakespeare, depending on the Shakespeare that I'm reading. And Romeo and Juliet just never was the thing for me. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, see, I, I can never get into that. I, like, of all the books we read in high school, like that they make you read. The only two I, like, even barely enjoyed is, I liked, um, Of Mice and Men. But the one book from high school I even liked was, uh, I loved Catcher in the Rye. Yes! That's, no. like, my favorite book. <laughs> I was hoping you were yeah, going to Yeah, that's my favorite one. I, f- I loved that book. For Everything me. else I read, I could, I, if you could burn every copy, I wouldn't bat an eye. Catcher in the Rye sucks. With, Excuse me. I didn't me. read Catcher. <clears throat> I love Catcher. Favorite... I, can, I can explain to you Catcher in the Rye. My favorite book I read in high school, um, I had already seen the movie, but I absolutely, absolutely loved One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Um, I also, I missed the mark with this one in high school. I wound up reading it my freshman year in college, but Frankenstein was huge for me. So the Catcher on the Rye is just some kid's bitchy Facebook page about how he can't do anything and it's all his own fault. So sounds about right. I had to read it twice because I finished it before the rest of my class, and then my teacher made me go back and reread it with everybody else. It's still a good book. Oh, I like it a lot. The only adaptation I've ever approved of that is when they throw the references into Ghost in the Shell, and that <laughs> I is it. Watch Ghost in the Shell. What? The Ghost in the Shell second season of the anime has a character that quotes Catcher in the Rye religiously. Oh. His in that show, I'll like check it out. In that show, all the cat like. Everybody's kind of got like these like cyber brains that are hooked up to this greater like consciousness web that um, this character can override everybody else's perception and he they can't see his face. They call him the laughing man because it's like an emoji kind of, but it's like back before emojis existed. So it's just the P with a colon turned sideways. So it is the, like this st- tongue sticking out face and then around it is text from uh, Catcher in the Rye. It's one of the lines. I can't remember. Um, I think it's the deaf, dumb, mute one. Okay. Um but and then throughout the rest of the show for that series while they're trying to find him he leaves clues that are all catcher in the rye references like he leaves the baseball glove he leaves everything else but they call him the laughing man and it's awesome hmm. as opposed to like the batman who laughs but, but yeah yeah prince of cats overall not a fan like i give like a five out of a ten I'd give it like a four, and that's just that four is literally all the art. Oh yeah, no, it is. I, yeah, I just I conceptually am super into it. I love a lot of the execution of the ideas, but the whole doesn't work as well for me. Just give me next month's book. I will. We have three of them. 
Oh. Well, what do you mean? I thought they'd... Wait, what? I have three copies of the book for next month. The, the Marvel? I meant this one. Oh, yeah, no, the Captain Marvel. Yeah, I thought, like, <laughs> I thought, yeah, I thought that was next month. I, thought, I didn't think we'd do well, Kingdom Come. Oh, well, I mean, Kingdom Come's coming up. But that Kingdom Come will be for, like, the beginning of April. I just wanted to give it out to people now so they have it. So with that, um, I think we're going to close this episode of the Comic Book Brew and Shoe. Um, make sure to find us on Instagram. Yeah. At whatever it is. I don't know. Comics Bancy. Bancy. Underscore BNC. Bancy. That's it. I don't know what it is. I just go back and find everything I'm tagged in to see how our page is doing. Um, <laughs> I considered a Twitter earlier today. I might do it. I might not. We should put it on iTunes, too. Can you do that? Yeah. I, I thought you need, you don't need like, licensing? Nope. That's pretty cool. I have a friend who knows how to do it. I'll look into it. Ooh. Neat. Because I know the Wolf Dunn does that. Catch us on iTunes. Yeah, possibly, yeah. And uh, anything else we do, because I'm going to try to see if I can use some of the strings I have with some other people that actually have followings to get us something. So, uh, yeah, stick around next time for when we'll be doing The Death of Captain Marvel. Yes! Just in time for the movie to come out where he dies. Hmm. But, uh, yeah, thanks.